two stories of Jesus and the Sabbath from the Gospel of Mark. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as he and the disciples made their way, they began to pluck little heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was the high priest, the Old Testament says Ahimelech, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. The Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would cure that man on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. And then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them and he was grieved at the hardness of their heart and he was angry. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So the man stretched it out and his hand was restored. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. This is the word of our Lord. The Sabbath has been a source of controversy ever since the beginnings of the law of Moses. It's been difficult to get it right because there is this thing called law attached to the Sabbath and there's always a temptation to believe that the law the rules, the guidelines, the boundaries, <laughs> the policies, the procedures are what are going to save us as human beings. But the Sabbath was meant to create space that we might love God and love one another, that we might serve humanity, be instruments of healing and peace, that we might bring redemption to people that have been broken up by the systems of the world, that we might bring justice to people who have been beat up by inadequate patterns of law, that we might redeem people who have been rejected by society. When I was in Bergen County, New Jersey, living there, we had a thing called Blue Laws, uh, by the way, for those in Texas, those are not cowboy laws, all right? <coughs> Blue laws in Bergen County simply meant that all the retail stores were closed except for the food stores. You could get food on the Sabbath. And they wanted to make sure that in Bergen County, in the Reformed tradition, who in fact kind of started that whole area, that people would take time out to be in the presence of God and be in the presence of their families and the presence of other human beings. Now, sometimes the blue laws took over the conversation and we forgot what they were about. We forgot they were about caring for people. This has been the problem we've had with the Sabbath from the beginning. Now, I believe that there's a deep hunger in all of us and in society to create space where we care about people we set aside our business agendas, our success agendas, our agendas of accomplishment, and we care about the human beings that we're with. 
You may have seen or heard recently of two African-American men who walked into a Starbucks and sat down waiting for a friend to, to, with whom they were going to do some business. And the person managing the store saw them sitting there and was concerned, and so she called the police. And the police came and arrested these two men who had done nothing wrong. And immediately Starbucks, as a corporation, said, whoa, this is not good. We've got to do something to change any inkling of that kind of behavior. So they apologized, and they made a rather expensive decision to shut all 8,000 of their stores down and create space to talk with their employees and have their employees talk with each other about what it means to not be held by racial bias. Now, it's very interesting in the way that was played out in the store training time Stores probably of about 20 employees each. They were split up into groups of threes to fives, and they were asked to watch videos, give their personal reflections, and engage conversations with each other with these guidelines. <clears throat> Listen respectfully to one another. Speak your truth. Honor others' truths. And remember, if you get off track in your conversation, pause, be quiet for a little while, be reflective, and reboot the conversation so you get back on track. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that that little guideline is the core of what Sabbath means. When we are going off in all sorts of different directions, doing our own things for all sorts of reasons, the request of God is to pause, take a break, become quiet and reflective, and get back in touch with what we're really about. And so it is that I believe Sabbath was always given for the purpose of having humanity, which we can become distracted, become refocused in what's really there and important. And so it is. Then in the meaning of Sabbath itself is the very purpose in which it is existing. There is a common greeting that Jewish people would give to each other on the Sabbath day, Shabbat Shalom. Peace to you on this day of rest is kind of the way it's normally interpreted. But I would like to say to you and suggest to you that both words mean a lot more than just peace on this day of rest. Shalom, as I've said a couple of times recently, means wholeness, completeness, healthiness, full dignity of humanity. Shabbat is from two words, which means seventh, seventh day, and the other one, to dwell in the presence, to dwell in the presence. So what I think this is really saying is, may you dwell in the wholeness and presence of God on this day and bring health to all the humanity around you. Do you see, on that, in that Sabbath space is a commandment to pay attention to living things, to life and humanity. The rest of the week, the other six days, we tend to pay a lot of attention to our work, our stuff, our success, our money, and the things that help us to get there. But the Sabbath is about people. It's about being. It's about relationships. It's about setting aside anything that might interfere with that. And of course, in this world today, which is pragmatic and rather materialistic, we are so preoccupied with stuff. And sometimes that includes our cell phones and our computers, our screens, that we forget it's really all about people. 
And by the way, the picture of a person isn't the same as being in the presence of a person. I know that's hard for some of us to get these days. So Sabbath says, be present with God and be present with other people. The way Isaiah saw it as the prophet when he was asking the people of God to turn from their patterns of busyness, he would say, treat the Sabbath as a delight. Desist from pursuing your own ways. Desist from pursuing your own pleasures. And I love this one the most. Desist from pursuing your own opinions. Can you imagine a day where you don't share your opinions with anybody? Now that's got to be a glorious day when people don't have to hear your opinions. You've got to see the humor in a little bit of what Isaiah is saying here. It's not about you. It's about others on the Sabbath and how you invest in others. Historically, there are two patterns of the Sabbath that are constantly at war with each other. There's this view that the Sabbath is about centeredness, where God is present in the middle of it, and human beings are valued in the middle of it. And the other view is it's about rules and boundaries and regulations and walls and defenses. You see the difference? You can have a Sabbath that's defensive and putting up walls to protect yourself from people who don't do what you do, or you can become centered in the presence of God who always invites more people in to that center. And we struggle with those two different rules. And the people who are surrounding Jesus and the disciples, the Pharisees and the priests, the teachers of the law, had this struggle because they be, all began to treat the Sabbath as a set of boundaries and rules. So let's go back to the first rudimentary understanding of Sabbath. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, we see how the Sabbath got started. God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, it says, God rested. But how did God rest? I always love this. This is a little bit of humor in the Hebrew. God rests by spending the rest of the Bible in conversation with humanity to try to talk them out of self-destruction. Does that sound like rest to you? But that's what happens. God is interested and invested in humanity to the point that the entire rest of the Bible is about God's Sabbath investment in saving human beings. God worked at restoring humanity to wholeness and health. And God's working in us right now, among us in this space, to call us to restored healing and health and to call us to becoming servants of other human beings so that they might experience all the dignity of full humanity. Let's go to another passage that also talks about some of the roots of Sabbath. It's the Ten Commandments. Now, growing up, I heard that the Ten Commandments were ordered in uh, two sets. There are four sets about God, and there, uh, I'm sorry, there are four verses and in, in commandments about God, and there are six commandments about human beings. Anybody hear that when you were growing up? Well, over the years, I began to wrestle with that, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me, and it dawned on me one day that, no, the commandments are in three sets. There are three about God, six about human beings. By the way, those two numbers relate to God and humanity. And then there's this one different commandment in the middle between those two. It's called keep the Sabbath holy. Why is that in the middle of those commandments? It's because unless we understand Sabbath, we're not going to be able to keep the first three or the last six. 
Let me say it again. Without understanding of the Sabbath, we can't do the law. We can't keep the law. Or we get all screwed up about the nature of the law. Because in that fourth commandment is to say, set aside time in God's presence to treat other human beings well and treat them with equanimity. So whether it's your son or your daughter, oh, by the way, sons got more attention than daughters did, so to treat them both well on the Sabbath. Treat free and slave people, slaves both male and female, well on the Sabbath. Well, the slaves weren't treated very well the rest of the time, And in the rest of the world, the slaves were never treated well. So it was a big deal for the people of God to say, time out, you're not slave today, we're all human beings together. And I think that's the reason why we mess up on all the rules and the regulations, why the law is dangerous without the presence, without the love that we have for God and the love that we have for each other. And so unless we have space, unless we have some intentional pattern or discipline that says, time out, let's reboot, let's figure this out and get in touch with primary purpose again, which is God is here and we're listening to God and God is pointing out that the people around us are very, very valuable, young or old, no matter what class, no matter what race, no matter what gender, These are human beings that need God's wholeness and health. And so it is that Jesus gave the example then of he and his disciples looking a lot like David and his followers in the Old Testament. So he was trying to explain the Sabbath and why they were picking grain on the Sabbath, which was, by the way, against the law. He gives an Old Testament example of King David, who before he was king, with his disciples, it's like Jesus there with those disciples. And Jesus is saying, if it was good enough for David to get it right, how much better is it for us to get it right? And isn't it interesting that the Pharisees, who knew that story very well, just sat there or stood there in absolute silence. Because underneath all that was a deep sense that Jesus wasn't doing Sabbath their way. Jesus wasn't keeping their rules. Jesus wasn't being defensive like they were regarding life. And so they needed to do one thing. Just like Saul had decided to do about David, they needed to get rid of the competition. And so Sabbath also means that when you buck the system or you buck the rules or you buck those that are in charge and don't want you to do that, they will get rid of you. And so there's always a tension that exists between the way the world functions and the way the Sabbath is meant to be. Jesus restored the intent of the Sabbath, not by saying, y'all got to take the day off and rest, but by saying that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, what Jesus does is a walking Sabbath pattern. And how the disciples walk with Jesus and see Jesus' action is a walking incarnational explanation and demonstration of living Sabbath. To love God and to love your neighbors as yourselves. As I've said a couple of times, I happen to be a fan of David Brooks. I'm not making a political statement by that, by the way, and his writings. But I've listened to a couple of recent interviews and his conversation about the book that he wrote called Road to Character, And uh, he talks about the reason why he wrote the book. He talks about in the book, there are two kinds of virtues. There are resume virtues 
and there are eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are the things that we do the first six days. All the success, all the attainment, all of the gaining of stuff. Eulogy virtue is something we should be doing on the Sabbath. To build character, to build relationships, to be loving and kind, to become people of humility and service. And the reason why David Brooks wrote the book according to his own confession is because he looked at his own life and some of the things that he wasn't doing right, he took time out, he paused, and he said, I've got to reboot my life. And the way he did that was to study other people and how they built character or their eulogy virtues. It's interesting to note that David Brooks was going through a divorce at the same time. He never says this in public, but you can almost read between the lines, I'm a flawed man, I make mistakes, and I can't even make my own marriage work. And so he discovered that there are ways to enter into Sabbath space to create eulogy virtues that we don't work on because many of us are more focused on success than we are in caring for other human beings. Well, today we eat at this table. And I like to think of this table as a place where we come to be in the presence, to be centered in the presence of the Lord of the Sabbath, who shows us by example and by incarnation of who God is and who God wants us to be if we pay attention and we don't get so wrapped up in all the stuff of life. Denzel Washington spoke to a college graduating class recently and he said, you know, You'll never find a U-Haul following a, a hearse. <laughs> you can't take it with you. But then I remembered that verse in Revelation that said, but the works of the people who die in faith will follow them into heaven. My guess is those are Sabbath activities. Those are eulogy virtues. You can't take the other virtues with you in a U-Haul, but you can take all of your relational ones with you. Think of it. Friendships, service, memories of how people have helped you in life. And so it is that we come to this table to remember how Jesus came to help us, to bring us to wholeness, and how we are called then to receive this and go out and serve others. That's why we have a stew pot across the street. That's why we've put them into air-conditioned facilities overnight, because it's Sabbath space for those people who feel left out. Help us to do the same for our own families. Let us pray.